This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunge and Tim Dahl. Hello, Timothy. Hello, and this is a technique that we used when we started the podcast because during the pandemic, we all went to Zoom. But now, um, with our guest tonight, Richard Edson, he's in town from L.A., and Lydia and Simon live walking distance to each other, so we decided to have a little dinner gathering and do it in the round, or in this case, a rectangle table. Do it in the raw, if you ask me. All right, speaking about a raw deal. Oh, boy. I don't know if you heard about this, but again, more than 15 train cars have derailed in Livingston, Kentucky. Oh, boy. Last week, spilling molten sulfur, sparking a fire and prompting mm. authorities to encourage nearby communities to evacuate, no doubt. So CSX, the transport company operating the train, said oh, only two of... At least 16 cars affected were carrying molten sulfur. Molten nice. frickin' sulfur. So specialized equipment was being deployed, of course, and, uh, you know, to monitor the air for sulfur dioxide, which is, you know, which is what is released when molten sulfur burns. And it's, of course, not right now known what caused the crash. Now, the crash, of course, it comes under a lot of scrutiny because there's been so many of them recently, including what happened in Ohio earlier this, remember that one, we drove through it this spring, oh, yes. which spilled more than one million gallons of toxic chemicals, including vinyl chloride into the soil and waterways. So That was in anyway, Palestine. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Palestine. So anyway, more than 2,000 people were forced from their homes in uh, Livingston, but this is nothing new because train derailments, this is just unbelievable. In the U.S., more than 1,160 such accidents last year alone. So, on average, more than three per day. Ugh. Yeah, well. Well, you know, I'm looking We're at, number one. Well, I'm, uh, it's, Toxic always, it's, it's always interesting when these things happen. They happen to occur in, like, the poorest parts of the country. I'm looking it up right now. The medium household income in Livingston, Kentucky is $25,000. So, there you go. Uh, so yeah. now, yeah. who's going to pay for this toxic waste dump spillage? I don't know. Well, and the thing is, as we said on the last episode with uh, Rick Royer and his Niagara, New York book, I mean, this is there's, there's so many super fun sites. And then, is anybody making super fun sites of these 1,160 accidents that happened last year? I mean, this is just, you know, we're it's, still living longer. Cancer's in the air. Everyone has it. Whatever. It's it, it's inevitable. It, and it, it is it, inevitable. It, even with um, if you're not transporting this stuff via train, <laughs> yeah. you things like pipelines. Guess what happens with those? They also leak. And leak. Shit happens too. Uh, anyhow, well, um, that's bad news. Maybe even worse news for a man whose name has not been released yet in Virginia. <laughs> uh, just the other day, 11:30 a.m. Well, as the cop says, it's an unfortunate incident. I hate that it happened. Uh, <laughs> oh. This guy fell headfirst into a wood chipper. Oh! Completely disintegrated. Ouch. They're still investigating Ouch. it. It's basically, Whoa. it was basically like a human turned into like a giant uh, spray paint can. <laughs> I mean, it was just suddenly. You a, know, a, it is a, the <laughs> only it is the only scene I liked in Fargo the movie, and I remember being in the theater and just so annoyed that everybody was laughing at everything until the wood chipper scene came up, and then I'm the only one laughing. I, I laughed in that scene, and I remember yeah. there's I, actually I saw that movie with Simon's brother Eli, and these old ladies in front of us are like, "Oh my God!" They're all mm -hmm. upset when that scene happened. Uh, like, what yeah. a way to go! I mean, it's probably pretty instantaneous. Is it better to go in a wood chipper or to have a long, slow, painful death from sulfur dioxide poisoning? Uh, well, I, I think dynamic ways of dying is so that's there's something a little cool about that. I mean, yeah, I'd, I don't want to die. Slow, in my the sleep. slow rot. I mean, no. You know, and they always say like, uh, you know, the, those last minutes and seconds when you're dying, you kind of flashback in your whole life and uh, you relive all this stuff. I go, well, how does that apply to people who explode? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know what? I, I think I've forgotten more than I'll ever... I think I've forgotten more than I'll ever remember even at those moments, so-called. I mean, we all could be already dead. Now, speaking of one of my favorite subjects, and this is a, this is a biggie because you know I love bacteria. No, you don't. So, <laughs> but, and bacteria seems to love me because I'm so damn healthy. But <laughs> scientists have discovered that bacteria are able to, like almost everything, communicate with each other using sure. electrochemical signals in the same way that, you know, nerve cells do. So not only do individual cells transmit electrical signals, but entirely separate colonies of the, micro, of the microbial critters can talk to each other, coordinating their actions like 
soldiers acting like, like a cohesive bees. military unit in order to manage resources. Now, suspecting that some form of communication may be involved, you know, the scientists, they coated the colonies with a fluorescent dye that changes its appearance when an electrical current passes through it. And incredibly enough, these colonies were using potassium ions, electrically charged particles, to send signals to each other in waves of electricity. Now, bacteria, despite lacking neurons, synapses, and a nervous system, they're capable of forming something akin to memories, and they can actually, researchers found out they can pass on their recollection to the progeny for at least four generations, but after seven generations, it just kind of dies out. Now, so bacteria, <laughs> one of my favorite friends, mm -hmm. I mean, we're riddled with it, have varying, varying levels of iron, which is important for their cellular metabolism. So those with lower levels were more accomplished swarmers. That means better at coming together. Now, because bacteria is a single cell. So they can swarm when they have lower uh, levels of of iron. So those with more iron in their cells tend to stay put making biofilm. So all right. Mm. So even more wonderfully evil about evil. bacterial, well, I mean, I do love it, mm -hmm. is that the international team of researchers sent E. coli to the International Space oh, Station boy. to be treated with different concentrations of, of uh, gentasiamin gentis sulfide, an antibiotic that usually kills E. coli on Earth. But the team discovered that at the end of the experiment, it was 13 times more E. coli in the space cultures. Compared Why? to the earthbound control samples, and the cell size was 63% smaller. They have no idea yet. They're researching it. But so, so shit thrives in space, it turns very out. Very dangerous. And now, I mean, okay, there are 2.8 million antibiotic-resistant infections in the U.S. every year, accountable for 35,000 deaths. Now, let's just get like numerical that. here because, you know, I love numbers. In the ocean... Yep. How many more times bacteria than stars in the universe, Tim? You want to guess? I mean, how, do they know how many stars yes. are in the universe? Okay. All right, I don't know the answer, though. Go Ten ahead. billion times more bacteria in the ocean than stars in the universe. All right. Millions oh, of viruses in the world, if they were laid end to end, would stretch for 100 million light years. Do you understand why I love the critters? So, I mean, look, we're riddled with bacteria in our body, uh, on our body, and basically, uh, bacteria outnumber human cells by 10 to 1. Okay. So, you know, you know, um... Well, wait, I just have to finish this, because yeah. this is even more reason why I love bacteria. Okay. Infectious diseases caused by bacteria have killed well over half of all humans we've ever lived on Earth. Oh, yeah. let's hear it for bacteria. Oh, wow. Bring it back. Well, you know, you know they talk Don't about... let it go. You know, 150... Okay. I guess bacteria is not a species, but they say 150 species go extinct every every day. A lot of those are plants, but how many? At how, first, they thought bacteria was a plant, but it's not. It's a single cell organism, isn't that? So yeah, bizarre? I mean, I, I, how many bacteria do we know have been just wiped off permanently? From I will get back to you on that one. Yeah, I'm curious and, but about also, that. so they've recorded <laughs> this sound. Does bacteria have a, a language that they communicate with each other? But they actually recorded bacteria. And it sounds like little drummers playing. Well, you, one thing is, of course, <laughs> one, one of the inevitable production uh, uh, predictions with global warming is there's all these kind of dormant oh, bacteria oh, that are, are going to be yeah. released upon yeah uh, in the you know, permafrost. The permafrost melting, and which leads to the next point: the world's largest iceberg. Oh yeah, uh, shifting uh, radically in Antarctica. Well, it was its name is A twenty big A twenty three little A. <laughs> so um, and so yeah, um, uppercase A twenty three lowercase A. It's 1,500 square miles. Oh. So, so it broke, it actually broke off the, uh, one of the ice shelves in 86, but it just kind of hung out. But, but now, but now it's, because everything's melting, it's ew. like, it's kind of like, kind of on its way, and it's, it's uh, going north on this, from the Southern Ocean, and it's three times the size of all of New York City, not Manhattan, the whole thing, three times yeah. the size of, it's an iceberg. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah. yeah, hooray. Um, yeah, but, you know, well, you know, the war is within and without and just about everywhere anyway. A little uh, swig over here. I mean, that, that's that's why I celebrate every day as if, as if it's the rest of humanity's last day. <laughs> so did you hear about this guy, Aaron James? I do not. Do you suggest the, I... Arkansas man. Um, hmm? he did, I think he's actually Oklahoma, but he was this... He had the world's first eye transplant. Oh, yeah. Um, he, uh, he was, you know, he's a, uh, 
electrical line worker, and basically he got sparks in his eye. He got he got zapped with Whoa. seven thousand two hundred volts. Ouch! Uh, like, I mean, it's basically does the that, eyeball feel pain or not? Well, I don't know, but his eye—he didn't feel anything because he was knocked out and his eyeball exploded. <laughs> oh gosh! Um, and he also—I mean, I occasionally get a hair in my eye that feels like a razor blade, so I guess it does. Basically, he woke up six weeks later. Oh, um, whoa! And he had one eye was had exploded. He had—he had no longer had any lips. They just full on fried off. Like uh, I'm surprised he had a head left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His his lower arm was surprised blown he didn't out. put his own head in the wood chipper after that. So so he so he he had half a face. Transplant, uh, and of eye transplant, and uh, the things they can do. Yeah, he so far his body's not rejected any of it. I mean, uh, the pictures are pretty upsetting. <laughs> yeah, um, from like where he was before these uh, transplants. It's kind of amazing this technology, but um, he's not gonna be the same anyways. I <laughs> don't. His, what, his like, what did it do? His fucking brain. Uh, is he? Uh, about shock I, I hope he's collecting pension. Uh, well, I don't know. He's, he's Arkansas, Oklahoma. He's probably, you're on your own, man. Oh, <laughs> That's how they do it down there. Uh, <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, no, no sparks yeah, yeah. in the eyeballs. I, I mean, electric. Well, we, we both. I mean, the thing is, I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the what, what? We've all been, ele- we've been electric. I'm saying, uh, you know, when they, when they don't have the grounding I'm right on, on stage. I'm electric when I'm not even near electricity. I told you, I, uh, one time I grabbed a mic. I was in Prague. And it was the worst stage electro- electrocution I've ever had. I've had little little sparks here and there, but this one was so bad that my I couldn't let go. My whole forearm oh, started seizing wow. up. Like the electricity was like what w- happened? Was How'd winning. I, I just like willed it. Like oh, oh like wow. I, I threw it out. Wow. And it just kind of because my heart started racing too. Oh shit! It was, it was like yikes. I'm getting you know, electrocuted. Look, I mean, it, it, we are surrounded by electricity. We still have no idea for the most part how it works. You turn on the light, it goes on. I have no idea. It's all look. There's so much. Mystery and, you, and magicality. Have you, ever, have, you ever, have you ever just been in that kind of electric zone? Like every time, you like you touch something, like a light bulb will go out, or well, you ever have like those? Yeah, well, what? A, yes, ele- yes. Electric equipment is breaking every time you touch yes, it. Yes, uh, yes, I have had, I have had those phases, and also I, I can feel electricity when things aren't even turned on, and that's disturbing at times. Yes, I have had spates of <laughs> causing electrical appliances to not work. But yeah. you know me, Tim. I'm highly electric. <laughs> Cool. Kind of volcanic, actually. Ooh, Always that, that's, hot. That's, uh, well, that's like tectonic. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I am like a teutonic volcano that's about to explode at any given moment, well, but it's, that's it's just your, your, me. Your, your Sicilian side is on a different tectonic hey, plate than... Net, no, you never know. ...than the, the rest of uh, The Italy. thing is, though, you know that I am rare to explode, but when I do, you better cover your fucking eyeballs. Yeah. Or your balls in general. Because uh, you, you don't, well, just like... You, you can just spit lava and, <laughs> and the job's done. But if you erupt, I don't even know if I've really seen a full Lydia eruption. Actually. You have not because you know what? It would be too easy for me to do that because this is why, you know, you know, sadism is just, it's, why, why, why would I bother? It's like, it's like road rage. Why would I, why would I get, get upset over petty shit when I, my hatred is so much bigger than that? I mean, right, right, right. I mean, you know, I, I'm I, a, I, I'm I, a, I got teasers. You only gave me some yeah, teasers. Yeah, I'm a happy hater. Leave me alone. All right, anyway, this is the Lydian Span with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and our guest, Richard Etzin, right up. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, episode number 229, and with Richard Etzin, who I've known on and off since maybe mm, 78. Hi, Richard. Richard, but by the way, he's not only an incredible actor, he's been in, I think, over 80 films. Great musician. I just saw him play with uh, Tim Dahl and Matt Nelson the other night. And a great photographer who has a new book out called uh, Year Zero. Hi, Richard. Hi, uh, yeah. We used to live across the street from each other. Yes, I, yes, we were. And you invited me to dinner one night. What'd I make? You yeah, remember? Let's, let's hear that story. <laughs> uh, it was good. I was very uh, surprised that you were such a good cook amongst your many talents. You're hungry. We all were. When you're poor, you got to cook. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> that situation was clearly cooking. And, uh, Speaking of cooking, I smell something cooking. In well, the, the producer, Simon Slater, is making a brisket the slow only, cooked. The only reason I came over here because you offered me a dinner, too. Uh, that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. That, that's that reason is, enough. Hey, I, mean, I, you know, I don't need to know everything. So, so you, I don't need to know everything you think you're going to get tonight because you might just have a fantasy that I cannot fulfill. Okay. Oh, I'm oh, not sure. Oh, oh, oh. 
So Richard, I mean, what a what a fun day! You're uh, you're in MoMA, and then you trekked all the way to Brooklyn to, uh, for this, and you have yeah, a meal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything in MoMA stand out for you? I want. Oh, first of all, Ed Ruche. Ruche. He does LA. not stand out to me. Now. I do not understand you that don't like it. at all. And Whoa. he is one of the most uh, celebrated, celebrated, and he has painted some like top three guy in in the world right now. Right. I do not get it. Thank you. I do not I get, get it. it. And he kind of does the same thing over and over. Uh, I mean, can I stick a paintbrush up both of our asses and we just go against the wall and try to sell it for a couple of mil? Well, that's more like uh, ah, well, I guess. Uh, um, uh, Jackson Pollock. Yes, right. well, which is another one of my non-favorites. So but I know he broke tradition, but I really have to say, uh, you know, I can do multicolor spit on a painting. Well, you know, it's, I think thing. with art sometimes you might have a vision, but what you become might not even be what you imagined. And and sometimes you 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 have a responsibility to do something that has to be done. Well, and you're assigned that task from who knows. But also where. what you represent at the moment could be more important than what the work actually was. So that's that I have to give credit for what he broke Ooh, in the art world. Jackson Power. Yeah, he broke things, but that's like you were saying. There's an amazing book about him that I read called The American Saga and American Saga. And it describes his life, but in, in the context of modern American art and how American art, art, uh, Ex uh, um, um, expressionism broke right. with surrealism and exactly right, uh, and it's it's amazing, and that's all he could do. But right. he was the guy that did it. Right. I'm more into Marcel Duchamp, or even with paintings. I'm more into like Caravaggio or abstract expression. So I mean, you're, you're you're an actor. I don't know if you run into De Niro, but what's the rumor about De Niro's dad and Jackson Pollock had sex once? I'm only <laughs> once. Yeah, I'll confirm it. I have no yeah. idea. Because <laughs> De Niro's dad was a pretty successful artist. Yeah, he was part of that world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, um, let's go back to the to, to the roots of, of Richard Edson. So first of all, you're from New Rochelle. You get to New York in what year? You got to be. I was born in Manhattan. Right. And we were talking about that. I, we left at the age of four. Like a lot of... Uh, Third, second generation Jewish families, right? They they moved to the suburbs. So I was born here. Now I gotta say the four the four first years they say are you learn more in your first four years than you do in the rest of your life. So I gotta say I, my my roots. I'd like to say my roots are totally in, in Manhattan, Manhattan, New York. Yep. And then we moved to the suburbs, and all my family was still in the city. So we were we were going, always gone. So I never did. I hated the suburbs, too, so I'm more identified with the city anyway. But then I went to college. I went to um, uh, Bard College. Yep. And I didn't like it. I came into the city. What were you studying at Bard? Sociology. Well, yeah, whatever you want to make up. Sociology. Sociology at Bard will get you uh, a degree. will get you well, zero. I was, <laughs> well, and... Uh, yeah. But you had another path that was successful, so you didn't have to fucking. And you, huh? left, you left Bard, right? You didn't. Did you, you graduate? No, no, no. I said the two years because I realized I was not much of would ever be a sociologist. But I, but I was kind of political, so I thought, okay, let me study society and figure out how to change things. And where, but they realized it's really about statistics, right. and you got to learn how to do surveys and do. Uh, it's dog labor, basically. Yeah, not creative. Like, no, that's boring, boring, boring. Right. And then I dropped down and went to the, I started writing poetry at the Poetry Project okay. with uh, Lewis Walsh. Do you know that name? I don't do uh, not know, it, but I still get, I still get the, the, the monthly missives from the Poetry Project. Yeah, yeah no, it was great. It was, it changed my life. And what was her name? I, I know this is, this is 1974. So there was the, it was a right, after the beat, it was all uh, Ann Waldman. Yeah, she was ahead of them. Did you ever go to Naropa and teach, do anything Never there? Did. I, I, I went there. I, I oh no, see. I did. Okay, now you're remembering it. I hitchhiked across country, and I ended up a Boulder, right? And there was a they were having a night where they were doing the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and it was a musical. Oh boy, a verbal kind of thing, and you know the big hall they have there. It was like 800 people. They lowered the lights, and I was not ready for this at all. It was like <laughs> what we did the other night, kind of. But uh, wait, which, which, which other night? Uh, yeah, last night. Oh, well, last night. You weren't ready yeah. for it, you were saying. What do you mean? No, it was totally fucking demonic. Yeah. And 
I was not ready for it. And well, I'm not, yeah, okay. Too much to handle. Was last night's show the most demonic of the four? Could, huh? Uh, of all the performances we've done together, which is not, we've done four total, was last night the most demonic sounding one? Uh, yeah. I, think, <laughs> I think it kind of was too. Yeah, you see, uh, you're, you're yeah, growing into your I, satanic roots. You know what? I thought that we were kind of, at times we were at cross purposes. Yeah, well, that's okay. And, but that, because the, the conflicting energy creates a, a kind of demonic in, uh, sense of things. We had, we had a little se seance kind of chant thing to end. You know, what, what was cool, I thought, about the ending last night, not talking about our show, but, oh, why not? You are um, talking yeah, about exactly. it. Go ahead. Let's hear about it. I always find that um, novelty at the end is always a cool trick in music, where you, you basically have a certain trajectory, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there's like this coda actually there's a whole term for this in music language it was, where it's like what the hell is that and then it ends it was kind of just me and you yeah it was while, right? that was cool and it was kind of oh, uh, it was demonic and i had this i had that harmonizer with oh when i was getting the tree yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, it was, yeah a and you were demonic voice so, like, finally oh. finally you're embracing your satanic roots your demonic roots excuse me the difference so <laughs> So yeah, let's get let's get back to when you landed in New York. That again, after you know, when you were four years old. So you're you're hitchhiking around the country. You go to oh, Naropa, right? Yeah, and, that's too much for you then. But you're writing poetry, and then I ended up there, and put, and I was studying trumpet. Oh, I didn't know that because that was your first instrument, wasn't it? Yes, but it turned out I was very uh, persistent, but I was not very good. You know, with uh, a <laughs> with the trumpet, you got the embouchure. Oh, that that that's a that's a beast. Brass is you have to. And it takes if effort. you don't get your fucking embouchure, you can't. They can't do it. I but I was like, I wish I had played guitar at that point because oh. guitar is fucking easy compared. To ah, that. nobody needs another guitar player. But go ahead. That's a, <laughs> that's another thing. But compared to trumpet, and I yeah. I labored at the trumpet for four years, and when I gave it up, I I I, I discovered drums. I was living with a drummer in Albany, so from. Uh, from bar to the city to Berkeley School of Music for six months. You went to Berkeley for six months. Six months. I hated it. Because <laughs> I, I was playing trumpet, so I couldn't, I couldn't connect to anybody. Yeah, right. I, I didn't know how. It was so frustrating. And then I um, went to SUNY in Albany, and that's when I started studying English and music composition, and uh, started hooking up with, with like really interesting people. They had a thing called Workspace, which is like a collective of artists there and very political and very uh uh avant yeah really interesting who's a composition teacher there huh? at suny albany who was the composition teacher i don't know. you don't remember mm -hmm. okay just curious i, I remember I, I i wrote a thing called chevy uh 57 chevy with four you know uh what did he call it with four uh, uh four what point you know, okay counterpoint yeah 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 exactly yeah. figured base counterpoint yeah, yeah exactly. i never heard it I still have it. It would be easy to program it. Well, well, well you know, Richard, Can many we... of the great master composers never they, hear they, the word. Quarter their shit fucking perform because they were working well, out. Because if you, it, it caught, well, when you're writing for like the mathematics, when you're writing yeah. symphonies, and a lot of fucking money, and they couldn't, just yeah. like any of us, they couldn't they raise could, the money to realize they could shit. play it on piano. And well, you knew reductions. I mean, I mean, Charles Ives was so ahead of his time; he was rich. He still couldn't fucking hear all his shit. He, I mean, there, there's there's pieces. People just like just like archaeologists, people dig up old uh old scores that have never <laughs> been that, that no one ever fucking well heard. I, I I gotta say my score looks beautiful. It might be great as a poster. It it maybe it sounds terrible, but it looks great and maybe someday I'll actually So then it. when did you you so say you then you were living with the drummer? I was living with drums because drums just seem you seem so natural with the drums and I mean, from I the sat, very beginning. I, I sat down at the drums and I was like, "Oh, this is what yeah. it's like to play music." I couldn't really because it was in you, obviously. And I gave up the trumpet about two weeks later. Uh, but but you know what? I just had an epiphany. Your obsession with symbols. It was kind of your marriage between the trumpet, like the the, the ah, metal, the metal ah. brass. I think there's something about you love symbols so much. I think it was kind of your way of. Not no, totally. No. Sur no, it's just bullshit theory. <laughs> bullshit theory. Okay. No, because symbols more about oh, I know texture. Nice, exactly. All right, and it's not really about. It's not pitch, so, all right, how long were you playing? Actually, playing the drums before you started playing with the group. Uh I started playing with the group like the next week. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was the time. 
But yeah, in 60, 67, yeah, it was like right after Sex Pistols came out. And it was like 76. 76. Not 67, 76. 76. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, right. that's when I, was, I graduated from Auburn. And uh, um, yeah, it was like, fuck it, let's just do it. But the problem was the guy who owned the drum set, he, he was really jealous and he wouldn't let me play. Because you, you were just, you, you were natural. And you walked right into it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're natural. I, I mean, I mean, and you don't have your own drum kit at first. No, I never had. I didn't have my own guitar with Teenage Jesus. I had to borrow one. So how do you deal with guitar. a jealous man? Like, what do you? What are your techniques? Yeah. Usually, like, uh, you said you said he was very jealous. So how do you, how do you handle a jealous man? I moved to San Francisco and bought myself a drum kit. Oh, and I set it up in the basement of this apartment I had, and they, they, it was a, a Chinese guy who was the landlord and his two kids. They were kind of weird kids. And it would come down, watch me and listen to me play, and do this kind of spastic dance. Oh, nice! I was, I was like, so cool. And the father was like, very uh, um, 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 uh, grateful because he kept his kids out of trouble. And that, <laughs> and then I started joining. <laughs> No, it's great. So, so then you're in San Francisco, but then, but then you come back to New York because you're in bands in New York. Yeah, what happened was that. Um, I found San Francisco was very white. And I was, I heard two people. Not I, Oakland, though. Huh? Not Oakland. I didn't have much. But Oakland and San Francisco yeah. are two different beasts. Well, and this is in, in 78, 79. Yeah. So all the music that you could uh, um, 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 access was just white kids playing punk and uh, art punk, you know, like the residents. Sure. It, it, it's kind of egghead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Residents, I heads, yeah. I heads. Yeah, but still, I, yeah. it was too. It wasn't cool enough for you. It was it too dorky. Cool yeah, I always loved James Brown, and I love Miles Davis, and, right. and I love jazz. But yeah. jazz is a virtuoso style, and I'll never be a virtuoso. So, so, uh, <laughs> but, but you know, My, Miles Davis. When you say that, and because uh, he kind of gave a middle finger to the whole obsession with virtuoso shit when he started going into the mid 70s right before he retired for four years because he had guys on on that band who were just like just cool motherfuckers oh, like michael, just, michael michael Hennessy. so so it's like one of these that things. was it a bitch's group yeah. well, well, that, that changed everything for me sure because but, of mine, oh you can do a groove you, you can do a repetitive bass line you can do a regular drum beat and still do very sophisticated music well bitch, bitches brew you know of that era i, I like uh on on or off the corner on the corner more i mean Live Evil was it Live? I, I'm getting mixed in all of them. Yeah, but, but that Jeffrey Diaper, Bitch and Booze started, yeah. started it from my started it, but it was I think it was really, first really that, in the that silent series. way. But okay, sure. so so sure. you're in New York, and this is now so like I, so I heard James Chance and I heard the Lounge Leaders, and then you said, "All right," I said, "I got to get back to New York." Thank you. Right. Oh, so you heard them while you're in San Francisco, right? And I thought, okay, so this is happening. You let go of your roots. I get it. Yeah, and I was like, I got to get back to New York. Right, because so, it was taken because that show was taking it somewhere else, but using what they had, what they were into before, and then especially with the contortions, trying to take it somewhere else. Yeah, and with a different having, energy, having a groove, not having a rock beat. Right. Yeah. So, syncopation. Did you see contortions in San Francisco before you saw them in New York? You never even saw them. Wow. Because you were living in New York when they were still existing, right? Never saw them. Never saw. I saw. I saw. Uh, you heard them. I saw Lydia Lunch. All right, but you, how the hell did you see that? I saw DNA. That must have scared you. No, you know what? <laughs> because you guys were more experimental. I was always into experimental music, and James Chance was not experimental. But 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 by by yeah. default he was. He was yeah. kind of like he was, James was so weird that his attempt to be normal still <laughs> was experimental. Well. Yeah, kind of. But it was still he was playing very. Funk bass, just uh, but so it, it, it's kind of simple in a way because his his interpretation of it wasn't simple, right? Right. So and then you heard DNA and you heard Lydia, and it was like oh, Mars. Was, what about Mars? Mars. That, these person who come, these people come from another outer square. Right, 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 right. It's more challenging to to, to the, the listener as well. To the listener as well, which is why I hooked up with um, Sonic Youth, Sonic Youth, because they were experimental. And that, and I was doing comp at the same time, which was more uh, a groove. Groove based. So you're, doing, you're touching both 
Yes, yeah. right there. Yeah, experimental and more groove. A yeah. foot in each. And, and, and so you had it made at that point, and then you said, "Fuck this, I'm going to act." No, I say <laughs> no. Comp had a few personality issues. Okay. And I'm I kind of made a decision to quit Sonic Youth in order to focus on comp, which I kind of regretted. Not because I would have wanted to keep doing Sonic Youth forever and ever, but I think I would have liked it for another. Three, three for four years. There were some personalities in uh, Sonic Youth that I, well, I, I didn't I, get along with, and it wasn't Thurston, and it wasn't Tim. <laughs> oh, Tim, I wasn't. Well, okay. Uh, not, uh, not Tim. Uh, Tim? Lee. Not Tim. No. Lee. It Lee. Wasn't, yeah, no. It wasn't Thurston. I like Tim, but uh, she, 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 she was tough to get along with. Now, that's the word on the street. <laughs> I'll hold my tongue on that one. It was like a dark hole. And, and, and am I allowed to say? No, yeah, yeah. Thurston is no, we won't. No, no. Thurston is still Thurston is still one of my favorite people on the planet. He's still Great. unjaded. He's still doing incredible stuff. Have you read his book? Oh, I did. You did. Mm -hmm. He sent it. But, 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 maybe it's but, but Richard, I don't know if it's true, but it's probably close. I Kim might have played more gigs than I have, and she plays bass also. Yeah. And, and 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 so I don't care what your natural talent is. It's like hammering a nail. If you do something all the time, shouldn't you shouldn't you get better? It makes no sense. I, as a bass player, I, I, all right, all right. Next subject. Right, I yeah. agree as well. But however, well, asking me? No, I'm he's just he's making, making a statement. You. You're you're making a statement. You're making a statement. Has, so okay. So you know what's interesting? I'm glad so okay. I, I, Jim Jarmusch. You know what? I had only met him one time recently. And the thing is, we were in New York at the same time. And you know how I, I was doing a reading down at Powerhouse Books, maybe with Jerry Stahl, and he came and I'm like, he had just released. Uh, I've never met him. I don't know how he have, he he just know. And he. Uh, were you in a Jim Jarmusch movie? Well, hang on. We're getting into okay. that, if you don't mind. So I had never met him before. But of course, I, I knew his films and he had just released Only Lovers Left Alive, which I thought was great. So I, I told him that. And then right after that, um, Cypress Grove, we did four uh, tributes to Jeffrey Lee Pierce wanted me to do this poem by Jeffrey Lee Pierce. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go and take some music by Jim Jarmusch and I'm just going to put it on this poem and see if if he, Jim likes it. And he did. And then he came back with some other music for it. And that just came out now. But I had never met him before. Is that but the guitar stuff he's doing? With it was stuff? with the lute player who the we lute. had on the show. Yeah. Yeah. Not lute. It's a... No, it's a lute. There's a lute player. Ood. He's... Ood. 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 I mean, I know that... We had him on the show. Ood is a, is a, I think it's I think it's playing Lutz. It's a loot player. It's a loot player. Oh, so anyway, this just came out, and this is just so bizarre that so anyway, how did how did Stranger the Paradise come about? So this is again like it's the early 80s or what? uh it was 82. Yeah. And we were, you know, we were all playing the same club. And, and there's John Lurie, who you really like the lounge. John, yeah, lounge and was, I didn't know those guys at all, but John kind of recommended me as the guy that could be. A good character. Eddie, yeah, the yeah. character. And uh, you know Mark Boone Jr.? You know, Mark yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was in Sons of Anarchy, Mark... right? Huh? He was in Sons of Anarchy. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, the Great character. Guy. Yeah. Uh, and it's a sideline. I, I, I shouldn't talk about Mark. I, 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 I That's love, fine. I love Mark. No, I, I once tried to press myself into Sons of Anarchy through him, but it, 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 it wasn't. Was the first movie that you Yeah, made? yeah. I never, I never intended to be... Actor, right? And it's so beautifully shot. It's so perfect of the time. Yeah, we saw that guy, um, uh, Tom this Tom the Silver, Tom the Chi, Tom the Chillo. Uh -huh. He was a film student, and he 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 was given an assignment to work with Jim on a on a, a student film. It, it wasn't a student film; it was a student essay. So Jim hired Tom to do the cinematography. And so beautiful. I think it was that nobody really knew what we were doing, but we had a lot of conviction. The same way there was everything at that time. Music, right? Everything right. at that time. If we you had the conviction, if you had a clear idea, and you're going to do it. And yeah. we're going to. And you're going to get it done. And you're going to get done. And you're going to put as every, quickly as possible, and with hardcore as possible. A lot of people miss that. I mean, that, that's kind that's of how that. that's how we did it. Yeah. That's how we that's still how do it. Do. That's how we do it. Yeah, that's yeah. what we still yeah. do. Yeah. And even when you cultivate something, you still want to keep the conviction. Yeah, you know, yeah, look. I, I mean, it's hard to keep that. No, it isn't. I don't face that. <laughs> well, do you do you find yourself not um, 
realizing your your designs it, it, no no i can keep it you got yeah, it exactly. look 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 it. you're still going and the thing is the beauty is is that as you have branched out not only with music and film but photography as well it's like the conviction is there sometimes it just takes another four because I, I have two things i get bored easily no oh and, really and what are you I, talking to honey and i don't think I can never be good enough to get to that stage in which I can just take things for granted. You know? Well, there is. I mean, look. When you're, well, that's, well, that's dangerous. No, no. When you're, when you're, you know, when, you know look, what I'm saying? When, when you are above everything and everyone else, you take nothing for granted because you just are what you are. And yeah. there's no comparison. So I don't compare myself to anything else because I know it doesn't exist. So I don't have to think I'm the best at anything because I stand alone in my field. So when you stand alone in your field, your conviction is there because you've got nothing to compare yourself to except yourself. So then you go on. I don't have your confidence. Well, I don't know why. You rub up against me a little longer. Maybe it'll rub up. But you, you have the confidence enough to branch out and do other things. You have the confidence enough to be in over 80 motherfucking movies. 80? You've been in 80. Come on, you do a lot oh, of I don't have I, I at least 80, maybe more. But but you do 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 you also do a lot of uh voice uh, stuff? No, no. You don't do that at all. I, I'm thinking about the word confidence. What what, uh, what see, I don't understand not having confidence because I would say that what I tried to bring to other people though is a confidence in themselves, the same way I have a confidence in myself by knowing if you are truly unique, and that's who we deal with here, there is no comparison or competition. You never had doubt. So Hell no, I never had any of that. You? Not much. I, I don't think I never had a moment. About that. I mean, I have so little that I have to really think about that. But I mean, this this isn't even a, this isn't even arrogance, which I don't think is a bad word. I don't think it's narcissism. I just think if you stand alone in your field and there is no competition, then what is there to compare yourself to? So therefore, nobody's opinion counts except your own, and you keep going on to do the next thing you I need to do. Very, Unique like that. Well, no fucking but doubt. I mean, okay. <laughs> the thing, what's cool about you is that you're not an egomania. And Tell to the no, no. I, I have to sit here and pump up other people's egos. No, an egomania. Well, thank you. But, which is great, but people who... What kind of maniac am I then? Just a maniac. Just uh, a maniac. I'm a maniac. There's a word for that. Well, ego and Mo monomania. I don't well, even know what that means. But it doesn't mean it's good. I mean, it does. That's what I'm not. I like it. I like it. No problem. Mono maniacal. Well, actually, I, I am more man. I'm a maniacal in that. Really, one of my deep set goals is always to find the people that I know have such incredible, unique talent that then I could come in as the cheerleader and just go rah 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 to the motherfucking rah, which is what I do. So, Richard, you know what ego me in what that means in Latin. It's a Latin word, ego. Now look at it. <laughs> this was a foundation to a lot of Western thinking. It means I. It's yeah. a sense, sense of self. Ego is just translation is I. Right. It's a sense of your own existence. Which, which if more people had a better sense of themselves and they wouldn't need all the fucking likes on social media, which is what's causing so many teenage girls to commit suicide. If you were not your biggest fan, who is going to be? Why do you think rock stars are so sexy? Because they appear as egomaniacs. Most of them are insecure and introverts, <laughs> even though they're exhibitionists. I'm just saying, trust me, I know a few. Well, then maybe, maybe you're uh, delusional. I don't, I don't know. I don't know where your self-doubt is. I mean, you seem to storm right into any situation and just do it. No, I'm not saying I'm I'm crippled by that. <laughs> well, let me say that, this. See wait, you wait, I'm not saying that that is my entire way of you have being it. in the right. world. But there is a kind of a uh, back and forth thing that uh, I'm... Uh, and I think that's one reason why I love to work at my shit. Yeah. Yeah. And and so we know, you know, with performers, uh, musicians, actors, there's a lot of downtime. And so, and so when you're the hyper presence is being touched with your craft, whether it's on stage or the camera's rolling, that's very exciting because it really brings into some primal like presence. And then there's the downtime. And, and that's, that's when you that's get, that's the right. challenging part. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, I, I, oh, but you're musicians. I, I, I don't know if you, you find the physical aspect of being a musician right. is a is a real challenge to get your limbs as a drama. You got to do it. What you wanted to that you hear yourself doing as yeah. a trump player, as a violin. Well, you know what? I was amazed by seeing your performance the other night because I have not seen you live or I have not heard you in quite a while, and you blew me away. 
And I'm like, where have you been doing all of this? And he's in, in, in my, in my, in my studio. Back. Said, but you were real. It was really astonishing. And it was really weird. It was really good. It was groovy and weird, which is, you know, two of my favorite things. <laughs> I was very impressed by it. It was really dynamic. And I was very happy to see that now. Just happy to see that. So let me blow some much, uh, much not even needed, but much deserved smoke and say right, he was freaking amazing. Really, it was totally it's, groovy it's, and weird. I mean, my L- favorite. L.A. is is a, is a, a dead that, zone. Oh, no, just some bar. New York is a production town, but uh, it's hard. But but not as a performance town. It's hard. And so, I've but for played. films, I've met people who I can play with. I played in blues band, R and B bands, country bands. You played with before. Jake Labatt. You played with. Uh, okay? Well, wait a second. Yeah. Yes, I do. And I also, when did you play with Tito and Tarantula? Which, by the way, I love that soundtrack from dawn, from dusk Tito's to dawn. Great. I love I that music. Yeah, but it's it's pretty straightforward rock. Yeah, but it's very groovy, and, basic rock. And I was playing kid, but then I was working, and I was all, let me uh, play percussion with you. Only After Dark is a great song. That's one of my favorite. Oh, I love and it. T- you ever meet Tito? I did not. Great talk. Was he in the plugs? Yeah. Yeah, I, maybe I did. I don't know if it was him. It might have been. Who once took me for brain tacos. <laughs> Didn't want another date with that one again, I have to say. <laughs> Just saying. Let's go back to the films for a minute. So... I mean, you've worked with some incredible, I mean, Spike Lee, do the right thing. You've worked with Rick Rubin, uh, love him or loathe them. You've worked with Barry Levinson, but Oliver Stone, which to me, by the way, love and loathe at the same time. First of all, Natural Born Killers is one of my favorite films. Salvador, Natural Born Killers, yeah, yeah, Salvador. Yeah. <laughs> I love Oliver Stone. I know he's a misogynistic freak, is he misogynistic? I, but hang on. I read the book that the producer of Natural Born Killers Female wrote and know all about the horrors of his of his personality. But then I also wrote the book that was that was missing for over 20 years, which he wrote after, while he was in Vietnam as a photographer called A Child's Night Dream. This is his novel. Yeah. So I read them back to back. Uh-huh. And also because some of the some of Oliver Stone, I really love and some I really loathe. But how is it working with him? Um on Platoon, for instance. Well, it, it was funny was that we got there. Where'd you go? Got where? Uh, Philippines. Okay. Amazing to begin with. Yeah, and that was right after the Yellow Revolution there. That's when they kicked out Marcos. Marcos, yep. And uh, moved to the Upper East Side, yep. <laughs> he did. And, and uh, like- it, it melted. Yeah. So this is seven days after. So the country is kind of in lockdown and in transition. So it was it was great to be there. And what they did, they said, "Oh, you guys are going to have a two week boot camp." Oh and my they, gosh! And yeah. What they did, yeah. they yeah. brought us to the jungle. They pointed to a field and said, "That is your hotel. Here's a shovel. Dig a hole." So it's really like you're now in the army so, so it's like the comedy tropic thunder was kind of making fun of the set of platoon yeah 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 yeah, yeah. 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 because well, like, i mean and this is something so foreign to you as a human being who has never had to live in the jungle or yeah. face any kind of horror yeah like but that. for 28 years it was like a dream come true you know we didn't have bullets and no one was shooting at us but right. we got to experience what 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 it was like yeah. to be a uh uh, oh, what do they call it? Soldier. <laughs> yeah, but there's a word for the soldier they call it. Uh, uh, in Vietnam? The... Yeah, a uh, whatever. Whatever the word was. So they put us in the jungle for two weeks, and they had this boot camp. Boot camp, and, and it was more or less of a boot camp than like a total immersion in what? what the experience was like to be in Vietnam. And you're with a bunch of other white and black boys that have never experienced this. Right. And never. some of them really took to it. And some are really all right. Who took to it and who didn't? Come uh, on, I'll tell you. Willem took to it. I took Willem to Defoe. It. Yeah, um, amazing actor. There, there was a couple. How did Johnny Depp? Was he in that? He no, was, he yes, isn't. Was. Okay, was. Johnny was in it. He, he, he was cool, but Johnny is so come on. Cool. He's a soft boy. <laughs> I you couldn't tell. He was he didn't say, but I'll tell you who was the biggest. Uh, New Dell, first Charlie Sheen. Charlie Sheen was 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 a wuss about it. You're saying well because there were. You couldn't get the right drugs. I don't know what it. Was. I mean, I have to say, I do, I do, I do love Charlie Sheen on the decline. 
Right, right. So, so but, he grew up with his dad being, I mean, he, he grew up kind of pampered. But I mean, but hang pampered. on, but he was on the set of Apocalypse Now. No, his father was. Yeah, his father, was he, he was on the set. I didn't yes, know he was as a kid. Whatever. But he did, he did come up to me. I don't know, maybe because I was from New York. Maybe he knew I had some kind of other artistic background. He said, Dad, and real sweet kid. Uh, and he was like, can I show you, can I read you something I wrote? Amazing. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. sure. And he took me time. He's kind of a little shy about it. And I took like three Weird. pages and he he wrote a poem uh, in couplets, rhyming couplets about his character. Like breaking down his gas, it, it was a beautiful fucking. That sounds freaking amazing, right? Yeah. Wow. Do you um, so awesome. he's, he's kind of an innocent guy who went off the deep. Well, he's... look, come on. I, I, there's something very cool and very damaged about him. Right. Come on. Right. I mean, I never met him, but I know yeah, a friend I knew who is. No, he was he was an innocent kid, yeah. which was kind of cool. Which was hard to believe when your dad is. Mar- that's not the move. That's not the real thing. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and and oh no, but the whole Hollywood thing. And come on, right? But, but still, a good Catholic family. But it, but it still is a, a sense of innocence. And right. you know, and Oliver was a rich kid, super rich sure. kid who rejected his right. background right. and by rejecting his father was to go to Vienna. Yeah, and yeah. become a grunt. That's yeah. the word. Sure. Uh, photographer right. there, you yeah. Call him grunts because you're walking in a field with forty pounds on your back and you grunt all day. I mean, and, and the thing is, look, thank the good goddess that all of the people on that film did not have to go to Vietnam, did not have to go to war. That your generation was one generation well, away, you just, yeah. right? You just skated away. Yeah. So you know, without uh, without being prejudiced, what's your favorite Vietnam movie? I know you've, you're in Platoon, but what's your actual favorite Vietnam movie? It's not the Kubrick one. Not the Kubrick one. No, not the Kubrick Well, one. I always thought the first half is a comedy. If there's a laugh track. Oh, <laughs> say the boot camp. We cut up Apocalypse Now. Come on. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. Those added scenes, the Playboy scene. and the, 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 phenomenal. The French Mansion. And the, All of it. Phenomenal. Oh, too. You like it? Yeah. I mean, have, okay. you got that one. The, I think do the right thing. It's quite easy. Well, that's great. Right. Well, we'll, we'll, right. we'll, we'll talk about it. So it's interesting. Because I saw I saw a documentary on Ferris Bueller's Day. <laughs> there, there is a movie that was made called. Uh, you got to remember it about the making of, and the, the making of was those two weeks, and they they made us work so hard, and and some of those dudes who were in it, actors, but that was the highest point of their life, and they can they, they haven't. I gone. Know. Even we had four guys that were actual Marines, right? Who actually went to. Uh, who went, went through real tra- real oh. the, the, making, storm. making the uh yeah. platoon is their highest <laughs> point so we're doing these two weeks and we had a trainer colonel uh, dale Dot, captain Dot, and he was this uh, kind of okie from uh oklahoma right that's an okie and he was he was he was, he was as right wing as oliver oliver was left wing <laughs> and he trained us and our loyalty was to him. It wasn't to Oliver Stone. Right. So Oliver Stone came out during the training part, and he was like the visiting general. You know? <laughs> and like, we don't have any respect for him. It was, uh, what did they call him? Uh, uh, a REMF. A REMF is R-E-M-F, which is a rear echelon motherfucker. <laughs> so you didn't respect these guys. And he comes out, and he... Um, he uh, he meets with all of us as a director, you know, and we had to break down. It's like, okay, we're not now. Now we're out of character, right? We thought we were real soldiers, right? <laughs> well, you're in, you're okay. And that's the way they treat us. And you know, we were actors; we were a lot more imaginative than real soldiers, and we took to it right. They couldn't believe how quickly we we adopted. I wrote a book about this. I, I'll send it. To What's you. the book called? It's called The Making Platoon. No, it's called <laughs> yeah. uh, Expect No Mercy. I um, oh, expect no mercy by Richard Edson. It sounds amazing. I was I self published, but I will say that, hey, nothing wrong. We love self publishing. We love self everything here. Come on. So uh, that was a real experience. So Oliver gets there and he's like, okay, let's do your scenes. And I was there with the other guy and we're doing our scene and we're doing his line. And he goes, that sucks. Hmm. And we're like, 
Uh, okay, so you yeah, 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 yeah. So I wanted you to make some shit up. Nice. So we 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 improvised a scene. I was from Staten Island. My friend was from Boston. He wanted to get a job in my family's pizza parlor after and we we just make shit up. Right. That's great. Go. That was it. And I, I, I was like, yeah, but he's a fucking Academy Award winning <laughs> screenwriter. Well, but the thing is, he taps into the real shit. So we do the two weeks. I mean, we were, that was a high point of the movie, was the two weeks in the jungle of being, being fake soldier. And then the movie was kind of anticlimactic. And it was like, okay, now we, but what we learned, we just brought to it, and that was the reality. So it was my turn to do my scene, the scene we rehearsed. We go into where it was like an underground bunker and right. we see all this Vietnamese stuff and they had just been there and then uh, we both die in the bunker. We go in there the day of and we start doing a scene and I would go, that fucking sucks. And it was so uh, demoralized because he, here he is, the Academy Award winning scriptwriter who couldn't give us any fucking lines, and then we make up our own lines, oh, that's it. and he doesn't like it. So we have to make up a new scene there. Right then the, on the spot. The do moment. it right now. And so I like to do like point to the reality. Right. And my, one of my scenes is uh, I'm pointing to the the, uh, the the fire, the tea kettle, and it's still uh, uh, smoke coming out. Look, man, they were just here. Yeah. And Oliver goes, what's the word? Which is the story? Um, I can't remember where you. It's like you're not supposed to talk about the obvious reality in the moment. Right. It's kind of sub. Right. Yeah. You got to subtext it. Right. And it goes to me. It's like you can't. You can't say that. And I'm like, I. I now I'm what? Like, yeah. I'm like, oh, fucking Oliver Stone. You got to come somewhere else I'm then. Oliver Stone. So and then he we could then then it was like I ah, just do it do it just do it the way you do, it. and that's what the way we did it, and that's the way it, it, it's in the film. So Oliver fucking painful. Yeah, he's he he's not a pleasant guy. He's not. He's no, not, he's, he's, not, not. Sati- he's not satisfied ever. Well, and the oh. thing is, if he's not going to tell you what to say, and then he doesn't like what you say, fuck off. What are you supposed to say? Why don't you tell me what I'm supposed to say? I think he thrives on chaos and making people uncomfortable. Yeah, which is, you know, not the way I work yeah, that, at all. That, that's anyway. Thing. So, that's, that's not what so I go, 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 that's the way. going to Ferris Bueller's Day hey, Off. Who'd you hear that from, though? Oh, yeah, you're wow. the only one I make uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. Oh. Please. I don't know what you're talking about. Don't make me uncomfortable, except that one time. Whoa. What one time? In Washington, D.C.? I got no idea what you're talking DC. about. Yes, you did. This woman comes out. Well, I'm shooting rats in the backyard? No, this woman comes out there. We're playing at the 69 Club. With the, uh, 930 Club? Nine, what did I say? 930? 69 Club. 69 Club. Sorry, you get it backwards. That's all right. 69 Club. And this, this very troubled young girl comes down, and she goes to you, would you carve your initials on Oh, back? with a razor blade. With razor and blade? I did. And you're like, yeah, sure. Why'd that make you uncomfortable? It wasn't your skin. I I can't. I'm not even going to watch this shit. You know what? Look, look, look. Let me tell you this. Let me just elaborate this. Both Tim and I, people come to us for things that nobody else can seem to satisfy. (laughs) It's just the way it is. I do not judge. I know I have desires nobody else can satisfy. Somebody comes to me with a desire that nobody else will satisfy. I take mercy upon them. That is my way of mercy fucking. (laughs) <laughs> Just so. I, from that point of view, I should have stuck around. And watched. Yeah, well, hello, well, you're here. Left, you're here now. And then I came back down to dress and I said, "You didn't like that, did you?" To me, you said that. To me. I go, "No." Yeah, well, too bad for you, I guess. No, but I thought that was it. Was well, at like, least I asked. You asked, and it was like, yeah, I, "Well, she didn't ask you to do it. I she had, asked me." I strong. I had a strong response. I, you're in the jungle with Oliver Stone, and you can't you were, make me walk. I, I think you respected that. Oh, I did. That I. Yeah, well, straight up. I take no I, judgment. He's not uh, satisfied with uh, exploitation or uh, tricking she was people. Oh, I'm she, I don't know. She was still bleeding. Oh. Isn't that nice? Isn't that sweet? <laughs> oh, let's let's bring it. Let's bring it to the here and now. So now, uh, let's talk about some of the other movies real quickly. Okay. Because uh, Howard the Duck. You mean no, Mar- no, Mar- no, Super no, Mario? No, no, Tougher than fair, leather. Fair, 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 I saw. It. Never I saw. It. I, I never. I never saw it. Because the, the original. Uh, Matthew Broderick's character originally was supposed to be smoking cigarettes, so that was totally edited out because there were all these scenes because they wanted to change 
the way of 3D and editing is so insane with movies, how they can totally re redirect how these things look. What I'm getting at is your part is one of the kind of steal the show parts. I mean, I, I remember as a kid watching this, even though you have, you have a small part, this is um, when you're, what I'm getting at is when you're not the main actor and you have, I wouldn't say a bit part, but you have a, a little part. I got to do it. Um, do you, you just go with it? You're not trying to steal the show, but like, how, how did that scene come about? I mean, were you? That's a very interesting question because that was my first real Hollywood movie. And uh, were you was... excited, nervous, like, yeah, I got no, this? Absolutely not. Horrified? I, I have never been nervous. On a movie. And not only that, I had, I had more comp. I've never had lack of confidence in the uh, in movies. Movies, yeah. Music, music, yes. Writing. Uh, that's amazing. Can I ask you, what's easier, music or acting? Fucking acting. Yeah, of course. Most actors wouldn't say that. Well, they, they think. Well, because they, they they're stumble bombs. But anyway. Right. So let's talk about the scene. So. John Hughes brought me, and it was the character's name was. Garage attendant number one. <laughs> and I was like, John, you bring me all the way from New York <laughs> for this. And you're not going to give my character a name. So he said, give yourself a name. So okay. I came up with the name Smizny. And I thought, all right, vaguely East European, and it doesn't have any vowels in it. And I, it's kind of funny. It has a nice little smiz name. Yeah. And so they they put that on my uh, shirt. Shirt, but they still credited me as uh, Garage Ten Number Number One. Oh. So I had no scene. I he comes in and he get, I give him the key, and he says thank you. I said John, you brought me all the way from New York, Blah. and there's no fucking scene here. He said. Let's make up a scene. And but don't tell, don't tell uh, don't tell the him. producers, don't tell the executives. No, don't tell Matthew. Oh, okay. Oh. So I had a few lines. Blah, blah, blah. I knew what I was gonna do. I'm back at the camera with the uh, at, uh Ferrari. And I forget what my first line was. But it was I uh, designed it to throw Matthew. He just he didn't get thrown at all. And that scene that you was in the movie is the very first scene we did. So, I mean, where did your confidence come in that acting you can conquer? You got it. You're it. I think it was because it's just play. What was that? Music the... is not make believe. No, hey, you, it's real. Being real in the moment right then real. and there. Hello. Right. What was just play? Yeah. What was your, what was your, the favorite movie that you're most, that you most enjoy what you brought to it that you have been in after 80 or some films? I have to say, of all the movies, I mean, Platoon, Stranger in Paradise. Yeah. I mean, did you ever see One About Me? Never saw it. I never you saw it. You see One About Me? Well, I'm writing it down. Who, who, who directed that? This woman, uh, Rachel Amadeo. Is, uh, uh, Rockets is in, in that. Johnny Thunders is in it. Uh, What's Richard, it about? Is it music? Richard Hell is in it. Um, Nick Zed is in it. Is it. What the hell is it about? Steve Ramon is in it. All right, um, I'm writing it down. Tell me. And Henry Jones uh, is, is. Why is this your favorite? It's it's like a companion piece to uh, Stranger in Paradise. All right. Black and white. What year was it? Nine, it eight, 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 eight something. And, and it was released in ninety three. What about me? It's called. What about me? Please see it. I'm going to. It, it was kind of disappeared and then rediscovered as part of that Club Fifty Seven uh, Mocha show. Sure. Remember a couple yeah, I years do. ago? I do. And yeah. uh this New Yorker uh writer, he 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 saw it as a this is an undiscovered masterpiece and it was uh now it's in the permanent collection of museum of That's where we en eventually end up. But <laughs> please watch it. Well, thank you. That's not only me but everybody else. Yeah. In the East Village, who loses a farm because Rockets regularly rapes her and then yeah, shows, well, that's shows her out. Red. No, but what you about know all those people? And all those people, no you, biggie. You, you will get such a kick and such a beautiful. Well, let's see. I'll hold my opinion until I see it. I did. Oh, you know me. So, me. what about theater? Have you ever done any theater? Oh, yeah. Do you have any interest no, in doing any no. theater? Why? It's too too repetitive. Too too repetitive. Too gay. Oh, what? nice. All right. <laughs> What about so? But just to wrap this up, going back to the origins, like your poetry. Did you ever do any readings with your poetry? 
maybe we need to pull some of those poems out and I need to get you back <laughs> on the spoken word stage. I'll workshop you if you need it. No biggie. I always thought of poetry as being on the page. You know what? I always thought of poetry as and, being and maybe mostly that's... dead, but that's all right. I just, I've saved everything and I've just compiled it. And I have a. I want to see it. In 1970 to 1978. I want to. I we will talk about this. And I, I just put it together as a book. And you know, smart press. What? We, Tell me about press. Press. smart press. press. It, it's like one of those self-publishing uh, sure. online stuff. I'm all for self-publishing. Well, I will. This is a this is a special um, edition. No, it, it you're in, especially inspiration to get it done. Uh huh. And. You just give me an address and I will send it to you. I cannot nice. wait. And then maybe I'll read some of those online live and I'll tell you how to read them. Anyway, this is the Lydian spin oh, with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl and Richard Edson, actor, musician, photographer, new book out now called Year Zero. Amazing Year stuff. Zero lockdown journal. Year Zero Lockdown Journal. Richard, are, are you, right you going to start becoming bi-coastal? Or are you going to start spending more time in New York? Now that I've hooked up with you guys, yeah. Oh, oh I've always been by myself. But anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> this is a little in-span. <laughs>